رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات الإماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين طغوا في البلاد فأكثره فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لبالمرصاد فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا ما ابتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأنهله الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات الله مسلم Master of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Chapter 89 of the Holy Quran, Surah Al Fajr, translated as the chapter of the dawn, is a verse or rather is a chapter of the Holy Quran which has been revealed to the Holy Prophet of Islam during the earliest of periods within his role as a prophet during the time in the holy city of Mecca. And therefore we find that in regards to the context of what we know in verses of both Makkan and Madanite, we often see that there is a separation between the two. We find normally that in regards to the Makkan verses being the earliest period of Islam and the establishment of the principal thoughts of Islam, it is normally in regards to verses regarding such things as Tawheed and Nabuwat and the Day of Judgment and Adalat and so on and so forth. As the migration of Islam took place towards the capital being Medina, thereafter verses moved in their own way to eventually becoming verses which could be associated and attributed to deeper verses of jurisprudence. Further verses in regards to ahkam that were able to become part and parcel of the level of movement that was taking place at that time. And therefore, one can already see that for Surah Al-Fajr to be revealed in the earliest points of the Makkan movement provides us with a very basic understanding as to what this chapter may be presenting to you and I. In regards to the chapter, we find that this chapter is one that is dedicated towards the master of the martyrs, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Sayyid al Shuhada sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi. It is not unusual for an entire chapter of the Qur'an to be dedicated to one of the members of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. As an example, we know that Surah Al-Kawthar is a chapter which was revealed in honor of the birth of the Lady of Light, Lady Fatima al-Zahra, sallallahu alayhi wa alayha. We also find, for example, according to many of the scholars of commentary, the chapter of Shams, 
Surat al-Shams. This is a chapter which is in honor of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa And we also find, for example, the last third of Surat al-Mulk often speaks about the movement of the awaited savior, Imam al-Hajjah ajjalallahu ta'ala farja sharif And therefore, it is not unusual for us to see that a chapter can be dedicated towards the master of the martyrs. Primarily because the movement of Karbala is such a profound one at all levels. And more so because we need to come to a means of understanding that certainly there is not a single takbir that is recited in the world today. There is not a single verse of Quran that is recited today. There is no salah that is read today except its form is in relation, it is still there in the purest of manner solely because of the movement of Aba Abdullah on the 10th of Muharram. And therefore, certainly there should be a chapter honoring him. There should be a chapter that discusses the entire movement from start to finish. And we find that this chapter is Surah Al-Fajr. How do we know this? We find a tradition that comes from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa in which our master tells us that you should read Surah Al-Fajr. Read Surah Al-Fajr. For it is the chapter which is dedicated to my grandfather Hussein ibn Ali. And he continues. He says you should read this chapter in your obligatory and in your mustahab prayers for the person who recites Surah Al-Fajr in his salah will be with Aba Abdullah in the same station as Aba Abdullah on the Day of Judgment. Can you imagine what his station will be on the Day of Judgment? Even though we may try to describe it, the reality is that there is no way for us to truly fathom it. And to be standing alongside him is one thing. To give ourselves in service is another. But for the sixth imam to make you and I a promise that on the day of judgment we will be on the same station as the master of the martyrs. One can only begin to really imagine what this chapter holds for you and I. Recite this chapter in your obligatory and your additional prayers for you will be alongside him in the same station on the day of judgment. And as such, this chapter speaks about a number of issues on a very face value level. Many of us will be acquainted with the verses And even if we know it by heart, it is still wonderful to see and read these verses from the eyes. We find that this chapter speaks of a number of issues. The opening sequence is a number of oaths. We find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often takes oaths in the Holy Quran. We find that thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of a number of tyrannical communities. He names them. He speaks of Ad and Thamud and he speaks of Fir'aun. And thereafter, he moves on to speak about spiritual stations, both the ones which are low and the ones which are high. And therefore, normally, because we read those great verses, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irja'i ira rabbika radiyatan maradiyya, we normally associate just those words towards Aba Abdullah. However, when we now realize and come to know that our sixth Imam says the entire chapter, is dedicated towards Aba Abdullah, it cannot just be these last three or four verses. When we see each and every one of these verses, they now need to be viewed in accordance with the movement of Karbala. When I see the oath, when I see Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun mentioned, and the low and the high spiritual stations, it all needs to be associated with the movement of Karbala from its very beginning until its very end. And therefore, our discussions, inshallah, in the forthcoming nights will be based upon this movement, will be based upon this chapter at various levels. We want to observe it from its face value. We want to observe the various layers that we can see and extract the deep lessons, both the historical as well as the contemporary. And you will find the deeper we go within each and every verse, every time we unveil a new layer, new realities will come forth to you and I, inshallah. And ultimately, we will see each verse is in accordance with the entire movement of Aba Abdullah from the time in which he is forced to leave the city of Medina 
until the time in which his blessed head is severed from his shoulders. We, insha'Allah, will take primarily the commentary of four great scholars. The first is very historical, and that will be Alama Tabrasi in his book, Majmu' al-Bayan. We will also take a, three scholars who are more contemporary towards our own lives. We will see one great scholar, Marhum Ayatollah Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, who was based in Lebanon, and he has a great tafsir by the name of Tafsir Kashif. We will see another great scholar by the name of Marhum Ayatollah Muhammad Saliq Tahrani from Qom. He was a student of Allama Tabatabai and passed away uh, in March of this year. And we will also see uh, a tafsir from one of the great living scholars of our time, someone insha'Allah that we can go and visit when we go on ziyarat to Karbala by the name of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi Mudarasi. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqi Mudarasi has a book um, by the name uh, of Min Huda Al-Quran. And Ayatollah Muhammad Taqi Mudarasi has written the most profound of introductions towards this chapter. For any one of us who has had the pleasure of reading Sayyid Mudarasi's tafsir, we find that he speaks on a number of social levels. As you can imagine, every mufassir writes in accordance to one particular style. One may look at grammar, one may look at philosophy, one may look at the social side, one may look at jurisprudence. And therefore, when we read a tafsir, we need to appreciate it is relative to the vision of that particular mufassir. And therefore, Sayyid Mudarrisi has his own way of thinking. And he wants to present the verses in a very social manner for you tonight to understand. He wants us to be able to elaborate on them with our own free thinking, the mind that we have been given, in accordance with the Ahl al-Bayt's presentation. He writes a unique introduction to Surah Al-Fajr. And when I say it's unique, what I mean by this is that for the one who is acquainted with the style of tafsir of Sayyid Mudarrisi, you will find that very rarely does he write an introduction to a, any chapter. He doesn't normally write an introduction to a chapter. Whereas in Surah Al-Fajr, he makes a point of writing an introduction. I have only taken maybe one quarter of this and wanting to present it to you. Let us read it together, inshallah. It was so inspiring for him that he said the following words. With this chapter, you are presented with literature that helps you come face to face with all the realities of the universe. It is like the carpet of Prophet Sulaiman, which carries you towards the horizons of these realities. It makes us witness the message of this chapter. You will be able to touch the message. You will be able to live with that message, and you will be able to mix with the deepness of that message. The pen of the commentator fails to follow the subtleties of this deep and high literature because the choosing of its words and the way in which they are connected with each other, the sound of its phrases, the waves of its meanings, the universes of its visions, the waves of its effects, no human being has reached the level to truly comprehend what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in Surah Al-Fajr. It is your duty to be open-minded to all those waves of knowledge and tides of innovative thoughts to open the window of your heart and ascend yourself to the level of the Holy Quran. I ask you a question, brothers and sisters. Have you ever come across an introduction to a chapter such as this one? Have you seen a scholar write that this is like the carpet of Sulaiman that can make you ascend to see the realities of the spheres of the universe? And therefore, we can straight away see that there must be levels of depth to this particular chapter. Although there are oaths, it must be more than just oaths. Although there are mentions of Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun, there must be more than just Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun. And therefore, when we come to accept this as a principle, we will then be able to delve into the reality of this chapter, to see the movement of Karbala, but also to be able to distinguish our own movement of Karbala through the chapter of Surah Al-Fajr. And therefore, we now need to come to a humble suggestion from my heart to your heart. We would like to request humbly that everybody comes to the Majalis from tomorrow night with a pen and a pad and a Qur'an, ideally with translation. 
we will be going through verse after verse after verse. We do not need to move between the verses together because it might take us some time. But at least to be able to write down those chapters and those verses to explore where Hussein ibn Ali's movement can be seen within one and all the chapters of the Qur'an. Surely that is the minimum we can do for his particular movement. And therefore to bring the Qur'an, even if it's in an iPad, therefore to bring that Qur'an is something very important for us so that we can write and we can begin to make note of those particular verses so that in years to come, as we begin to reaccount ourselves with this movement year after year, we can then see how Aba Abdullah's chapter comes to life this year and every year. I would also like to put this forward in my humble experience. We owe it to make a movement with the pulpit for tomorrow. We now have to bring forward a new and consistent dynamic message from the pulpit. And therefore, part and parcel of that progress is to be able to write, just as we expect our students in madrasa to come to the ambassadors and to come to the University of Ahlul Bayt with a pen and paper, we should also do the same thing for ourselves. We, the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, and the ones who have enmity towards the enemies of Ahlul Bayt, criticize a particular individual who refused Rasulullah on his deathbed to write something. Therefore, we cannot also be the ones to refuse to write something when we can write the words of Ahlul Bayt. We criticize that individual for having not had a pen and paper and not writing. Therefore, tomorrow, inshallah, let us not follow in his sunnah. Rather, let us follow in the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt and Quran and Majid that demands for us to move forward and learn in accordance with the verses of the Quran, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We will go from sphere to sphere, inshallah. We will break the boundaries of verses. We will peel open the proverbial onion with no tears, inshallah, until the Masaib. And as we do this, we will see how verses have various layers and connotations to them. How does this take place? How is it that this Qur'an remains new for you and I every single year? How is it that somebody who lived as a Bedouin 1,400 years ago in a tent in the deserts of Arabia would look at a verse and understand it in accordance with the time in which he or she lived in. And today we do the same. And tomorrow, if the world is going to continue for another 1,400 years, we'll continue to see these same verses in accordance with the time in which they live in. How is this possible? How are we able to understand this? And we need to see this as a primary or fundamental discussion before we go into the tafsir itself. Because you and I need to become acquainted with the levels that Qur'an can provide for you and I. We must become inspired with that book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say on Shah Ramadan, on the 19th, and 21st, and 23rd night, we put that Qur'an upon our heads. We say, Allahumma bihaqqi hadha al-Qur'an wa bihaqqi man arsaltahu bih. We're taking this oath by this very Qur'an. And therefore we are making that covenant with it. And it becomes a useful point for you and I at this very moment to introspect. To maybe just ponder for a second. When I made that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the 19th and the 21st and the 23rd. Since that point in Shah Ramadan has concluded to this point in which we're at the second night of Muharram. How have I upheld that covenant of the Qur'an with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have I progressed, remained stagnant or regressed? Did I make progress but then slow down? What were the reasons for that slowing down? What can I do from tonight to increase my knowledge of the Qur'an? Was I truthful to myself when I made that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that Qur'an upon my forehead? And as such, it becomes a useful point for us to really understand where my relationship is with the Qur'an. And once we begin to come to that point, and again we make the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we now want to go into the depths of this book. We do not want to be 
only reading it as if parrots or looking at it from a superficial level. When we see the verses, we are told that there are constant depths and levels to them. Very briefly, we want to mention that there are five terms, five words and terms that we can become acquainted with. And as long as we know these terms, we begin to realize that there are huge levels and depths of the ocean that is the Holy Qur'an. Five of them. The first one is muhkam, second mutashabih, third zahir, fourth batin, and fifth ta'wil. Let us just mention those very quickly. Each verse of Qur'an has many layers. The first one we can state is a term of muhkam. This means a verse can be very clear and decisive. It's very easy for you and I to understand what's being said. If I say to any child here, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ They will know what we mean. They are unable to state that Allah is two, or Allah is five, or Allah is ten. They know Allah is unique, He is one. This is muhkam. It's a very clear verse. Then you have mutashabih. Mutashabih, the root word is shubh. Shubh means there is a similitude, there is a likeness of it somewhere else. Which means sometimes a mutashabih verse means that you will find a similar verse elsewhere in Qur'an. Therefore it becomes allegorical, ambiguous. We need to see it in accordance with an explanation. Second. The third type of verse is which we can call zahir. It, is very, it has an outward meaning to it. The fourth is batin. It has an inward meaning to it. And the fifth is ta'wil. That it has an absolute meaning. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you read a verse today, at this point in time, in this circumstance, it has a certain meaning to it. In five years' time, when you read the same verse, in a new situation, in a new light, the ta'wil changes it and the absolute meaning changes as well. So you have five very principal terms that show the Qur'an has various layers. Jabir. May Allah bless his soul, one of the great companions, comes to our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad al Baqir, sallallahu alayhi wa And he comes to him one day and he has a verse. The hadith doesn't actually provide us with which verse it is. Jabir comes to the fifth Imam and he presents him with a verse and he says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, can you provide me with the commentary of this? Imam, of course, obliges. He gives him the commentary. A few days later, Jabir comes back with exactly the same verse. He presents him with exactly the same verse. Ibn Rasulullah, can you provide me with a commentary of this verse? He provides him with another commentary of the exact same verse. Jabir says, Ibn Rasulullah, forgive me, may I be sacrificed for you? Can you explain to me? I came to you a few days ago with this verse, you gave me one interpretation. Now I come back a few days later and you give me a Second interpretation, how can it be that this verse is going to be in two different lights towards me, one individual? The fifth imam says, O Jabir, know that the Qur'an has many layers. There is zahir and batin, there is outward and there is inner. O Jabir, for every outward meaning, there is an outward to the outward. And O Jabir, for every inner meaning, there is an inner for the inner meaning. Meaning that even though you have one outer meaning, that has further layers to it. The Holy Prophet of Islam and the sixth Imam have a concurrent hadith where they say, O people, know that the Qur'an has layers to it. Do you know how many layers they count for? How many layers do you think the Qur'an has per verse, per every single verse? Thousand? Ten thousand? Fifty thousand? The concurrent hadith from the Prophet and the sixth Imam. <coughs> o people, know that the Quran has layers. Each verse has seventy thousand layers to it. Can you imagine? Seventy thousand layers. One of the great scholars commentates on this hadith and he says, everything in this universe has to have a balance, right? We're in perfect balance and harmony. And therefore, if the Quran has zahir and batin, outward and inner, and if there are 70,000 layers to each verse, therefore there must be 35,000 outer meanings to every verse and 35,000 inner meanings to every single verse. 
Imagine when you next open the Qur'an and you read a verse and you begin to tear open those verses and you begin to really delve or dive deep into the ocean that is the Qur'an. How much can this mind and heart really appreciate? How far it can really go when it wants to open up the mind towards this blessed book? And as such, if you have 70,000 layers, imagine now when we come to this one verse, Wal Fajr. How many possible meanings could there be in the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mind figuratively speaking? How could we really comprehend this verse? How does this verse, Wal Fajr, depict the movement of Aba Abdullah from the time in which he leaves Medina al Munawwara? And that point, when you look at that verse through that mindset, you begin to now want to really understand that verse through the mission of Aba Abdullah. Here we go further. Now we understand principally the level of depth. I want to take that discussion further. 70,000 verses isn't everything. 70,000 verses isn't everything. There's more to it. We find that there are a number of verses in which the Qur'an itself says that everything, please note the words, everything is mentioned within this Qur'an. Now let us just fathom that for a second. Everything is mentioned within this Qur'an. This Qur'an is finite. It's finite in so many ways. What do we mean by finite? It has an ending. It's limited in so many ways. There's a young brother who's sitting with the Qur'an just there. And there's another one I think that's sitting there. Just think about this Qur'an. It might be on your shelves at home. It's sitting by your side now. How is this Qur'an finite? Well, this Qur'an is finite in a number of ways. One, it's limited to six and a half thousand verses. Even when the awaited Savior comes, he's not going to add any more verses to the Qur'an, is he? It's finite in that it has six and a half thousand verses, no more, no less. It's finite in that principally it's one language. It's the Arabic language. Yes, there are some few handful of words that may be other languages, but principally it's one language. It's still limited. Even if it's only two languages, it's limited. It's finite. It's limited in that it was revealed over 23 years. There are no more verses to come in the future years. It is limited also in that the geography of this book is also limited on one level. As an example, it may speak of Rome. It mentions Rome. But does it mention Alaska? Does it mention New Zealand? So on one level, it seems to be finite on a number of levels. But despite this, there are several verses of the Qur'an which says everything is contained within this book. Let's give you a few examples of some verses. As an example, we have one verse which is in chapter number 6, verse number 38. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There is not a creature in this earth nor an animal that flies with its two wings, except that it's an ummah like yours. And we have not left anything from this book. Ma farratna fil kitab min shay. We have not left anything from this book. One. Two, we have another verse, for example, chapter number 16 of the Holy Quran, verse number 89. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we shall raise... On the day of judgment, from every nation, a witness. And we shall raise from amongst this nation as well a witness, i.e. Rasulullah. And know that we have not left anything from this book. Everything is mentioned within this book. Then you go forward another chapter. Exactly the same verse. Chapter number 17, verse number 89. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And we have put in this Qur'an every kind of mathal. Every kind of example, every kind of similitude. You see here, there are many verses. We can show you several verses that say exactly the same thing. We have not left anything from this Qur'an. We have put everything in this Qur'an. We have put every kind of example within this Qur'an. Here I want to play devil's advocate with you. Assume for a second that you are not Muslim. It's very easy for us to be biased. Okay, God says everything is in this book, so I believe it, higher, complete. But imagine for a second that you weren't Muslim and I made this statement to you. Or imagine that you were an atheist, you didn't even believe in God, a creator. 
And I said to you, that book, which is so finite, which has covers from start to finish, has everything in it. Tell me truthfully, what would be your response? Would you believe me? What would be your reaction? Would you even entertain it? You may even scoff. You may even laugh at me. You're telling me a book which is finite in so many ways is infinite? No way. I don't believe it. But we as Muslims are told it, and it's in the Quran in several verses. How do we reconcile these issues? How do we come to this point of understanding this? How do I prove this? Where does my belief system meet with this ideology of everything being in Quran? The first thing is for us to realize that it literally means everything. Because sometimes when we see these verses, and many of you will be acquainted with these verses, they will infer that these verses means everything, like everything religious. You know, they'll say, well, yeah, it has everything. It has everything to do with Tawheed. Or it has everything to do with Nabuwat or the Day of Judgment. You want to know what the Day of Judgment is like? It's in Quran. Quran has everything about it. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say that. He said we have put everything within this Quran. We have not left any discussion within this Quran, out of this Quran. And therefore, when you look at it from that point, that it's not just what is typically stated as religious, but it's everything, it now opens the mind to challenge. Okay, let's challenge this book. You, my Lord, claim that everything is in this book. I want to challenge this tonight. Go home. You do it. Go home tonight. Tell me. Where are verses of psychology in the Qur'an? Where are verses of geology in the Qur'an? Where are the verses of economics within the Qur'an? Actually, let's put it this way. Let's be very specific. If I was to pose a question to the Qur'an, could it give me an answer? It claims to have everything. If I asked you, my young brother, and I said to you, tell me, from the Qur'an, from that book that you have in front of you, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create dinosaurs? Is it a legitimate question? It's a legitimate question. Dinosaurs, we know they existed. We know that they are now extinct, or we hope they're extinct, unless you watch Jurassic Park. We know that they're extinct. So a child, a child, or somebody who is from the school of anthropology, or somebody who is someone who digs up and is an archaeologist, do they have a right to ask that question based upon the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have not left anything from this Qur'an. Does the universe have intelligent life out there? Where is the answer within Quran? This book says to me it contains everything. Therefore, we need to understand what is meant by everything. You see, everything is the principle of every discussion, (coughs) if not the exact discussion itself. The very minimum is the principle of every single discussion can be found within the Quran. And that is an open challenge here tonight to anyone, to everyone listening on the internet around the world. Every discussion, the principle of it can be found within the covers of that very book. As an example, once Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan wrote a letter to our second Imam, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, salawatullahu salamu alayhi. He writes a letter. Now straight away from the words of this letter you can see the arrogance of Muawiyah as well as the hatred towards Islam. Muawiyah writes a letter and says to him, O Hassan, he doesn't even address him, Ya ibn Rasulillah, Imam Hassan ibn Ali. You people, this is not my words, this is not paraphrasing, this is the words of the hadith. You people claim that everything dry and everything wet is mentioned in the Qur'an. If that's the case, tell me, where is the beard mentioned in Qur'an? You people claim, where is the beard mentioned in Qur'an? Now straight away on one level, it shows the ignorance of Muawiyah. Because actually, the beard is mentioned in Qur'an. As an example, in the story of Musa alayhi salam, when he returns from the mountain... He finds that Banu Israel have gone back towards worshipping the idol. At this point, he calls whom? His brother Harun. And he pulls him by what? The beard. 
O oh, son of my mother, do not pull me by the beard. So actually Muawiyah was straight away ignorant of the verses of Quran, one of the most famous incidents in the whole of history of Musa a.s. Now Imam Hassan a.s. could have responded with that verse, right? He could have said, no problem Muawiyah, there is the verse finished. He didn't use that verse. That's the only time beard is actually mentioned by name. Beard is mentioned by word in Quran. But he actually responds with another verse. He says a verse from chapter number 7, verse 58 of the Quran, which says, As for the good land, it comes forth in abundance by the permission of its Lord. And as for the scanty, as for the scanty land, it does not come forth well. It comes forth scantily. Why did he use this verse to respond? The reason being is because Muawiyah had a beard which was very scanty. You see, the Arabs prided themselves on having very thick beards, as you will see today with some of them. They had their very thick beards. Imam Hassan السلام, was a very handsome individual. He had a very long, thick beard. He looked beautiful. He was a handsome man. And as such, Imam Hassan السلام, wanted to point <laughs> at the beard of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Look at the verse again. As for the good land, it comes forth in abundance by the permission of its Lord. As for the poor crop, it comes out scantily. And therefore, I am the good land, whereas you are the scanty and the poor crop. Difference between Ahl al-Bayt and Banu Umayyah. He used this verse. Now at one level, it's a very useful verse of polemics and to show what Muawiyah is really like. But on another level, it shows you that Quran speaks about principles. The Imam didn't use the verse of Musa and Harun, peace be upon them, to show them about the beard. He left a lesson for you and I. Sometimes a verse can be a principle-based verse. You have to see it in light of the issue that it's trying to mention. And the more you open up the verses, the more you will understand the various connotations to that one particular verse. Here someone will say, what's the process? How do I understand Literally, intellectually, the Qur'an contains everything, the principle of everything within it. We know that Qur'an talks about kitab, which is the book, and it talks about another statement called Ummul Kitab. You come across this term? Ummul Kitab. Ummul Kitab is different from kitab itself. Ummul Kitab is translated as the mother of the book. In fact, the mother of the book is not the Qur'an. It is a separate book. It is actually all the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the first creation to the last point in the existence of universe, all written within this book. In Surah Al-Qalam, we have that verse of Qalam. Qalam means what? Pen. What is this pen? Which pen is mentioned in Surah Al-Qalam? Is it the pen that is this pen in the pocket? No. It is a different pen. This is the pen which was in existence before you and I came into existence. The hadith tells us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called this pen in the primordial world, in the angelic realms, and said, write. The pen responded, my Lord, O Allah, what should I write? What are you telling me to write about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, write everything. Note the word, everything. Write everything from the first to the last. Al-awwal wal-akhir. Is Allah not al-awwal to wal-akhir? Therefore write everything from the beginning of time till the end of time. The pen wrote, you know where it's got its ink from? One of the rivers of Jannah. It went, it took the river from Jannah as ink and wrote into this Ummul Kitab. And therefore this book contains everything in existence. There is nothing that will take place in this universe except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge comprehends it and that it's already written within that book. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compressed that book, compressed that book and revealed for us the compressed version known as the Qur'an. How do we understand this? When you go home or you see a funnel, you know when you do science experiments, you have a funnel. What is a funnel? A funnel is very wide at the mouth and it becomes thinner, and it's smaller at the end. But whatever you put in at the top of the funnel, at the mouth of the funnel, is compressed down into the bottom, and whatever comes out is the same. Nothing is lost. Whatever you put in from the top comes out to the bottom. 
Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compressed Ummul Kitab to Kitab in a funnel manner and revealed it on Laylatul Qadr to the heart of Rasulullah for you and I. Therefore, when we say there is nothing that is exempted from the Qur'an, no discussion, no person, no analogy, no idea, no science that will ever come in the universe except that it's mentioned already within the Qur'an is because it has been compressed into those two covers for you and I to begin to fathom. Now imagine the scenario. When you go down, when you work downwards, when you descend, when you go from the top of the funnel downwards, you're compressing, right? What happens when you go up? When you start with the thin and you go outwards, as if the mind does it. When you ponder upon Quran, when we begin to delve into the ocean that is the Quran, we now ascend towards that funnel. And we go from a finite book of two covers up towards the infinite Ummul Kitab. And therefore, when we say, well, Fajr can have 70,000 meanings, it can be one word or two words, but eventually, as you go up the chain and get to the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, figuratively speaking, you get to that point where you begin to reach to his understanding of Wal Fajr. And now all of a sudden the mind explores the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's universe. Compressed and we expand. Expansion to compression. And therefore when you read those verses tonight, when you go home tonight inshallah and read for yourself, begin to ponder and ask yourself before I am able to present to you, what does wal fajr wal ayalin ashr wal shaf'i wal watr wal layli idha yasr hal fi dhalika qasamun li bi hijr have to do with the master of the martyrs. Our fifth Imam has a wonderful narration. Maybe he says that had the Quran have been for a particular time or group of individuals, that when that time expired or those individuals expired, so would the use of the Quran. But the Qur'an moves like the sun and the moon. Whatever comes into existence is already comprehended by the Holy Qur'an. Let me repeat those words. The Qur'an moves like the sun and the moon. Whatever comes into existence has already been comprehended by the Qur'an. Sun and moon. What a beautiful statement by our fifth Imam. Subhanallah. Honestly. It moves like the sun and the moon. When the sun and the moon begin to move in correlation, you begin to see new things each time, don't you? Stand in the middle of the street or in the middle of your garden, and at one time in the day, the sun will begin to rise and eventually set. It will present a new shadow, won't it? It will start here and your shadow will be there. And you will see the light will be here. And therefore you will be able to see this side of yourself. Or someone can see this side of yourself. But this side will be in darkness, in shadow, won't it? But as the sun moves, it will now be shining upon this side of my face. It will now show this side. And this side will become shadowed and darkened. The same thing with the Qur'an. That the sun moves and the Qur'an moves. That eventually over time you will see a different side of exactly the same verse. And similarly with the moon, the moon is only reflecting the sun's light in the first place. And therefore you will see tonight, go up and you will see the crescent. You will see the new moon. And eventually by the 13th and 14th and 15th of the month, you will see the full moon. In the same way, the Quran will show certain sides of it throughout the day, throughout the night, throughout the year. And you will see different sides and proportions and nur emanating from that very verse. When you read it today, you will see something new tomorrow. The sun, the Quran moves like the sun and the moon. And therefore, the idea for you and I is to become truly inspired by this book. The idea is for you and I to go home and challenge it. The idea is for our attitude, our approach to this book to change completely. If I believed truly that this Quran encompassed everything, then when I read a verse, when I begin to delve into it, I will look for everything within that verse and not limit it to the way in which I have become accustomed to limiting it. Imagine what Hussein ibn Ali saw when he read those verses of Qur'an. Imagine his understanding of wal-fajr, wal-ayal in ashr. 
was Shaf'i wal Watar. Imagine that night of Ashura when he himself read those verses and he now envisaged what was about to take place to Ali Akbar. What would take place to Qasim? What would take place to Ali Asghar? Imagine how he saw those companions of his in light of those verses. Quran moves like the sun and the moon. Ahlul Bayt were also on the move. They had been almost exiled from their own home cities. Aba Abdullah has a dua, he has a prayer that he makes. And he raises his hand and he says, O oh Lord, you know that we are from the progeny of your messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We are from the progeny of your messenger. And you know that Banu Umayyah have exiled us from the sanctuary of our own messenger and grandfather. They have oppressed us and they will shed our blood. O oh Allah, our Lord, we turn to you for you to take our rights up and to grant us victory upon our enemies. They are on the move, moving from city to city, from town to town. As they are moving towards the plains of Karbala, it is said that someone comes, a rider comes with the news of the martyrdom of Muslim ibn Aqil. They begin to hear about the broken body of Muslim. They hear that Hazrat Muslim, his body was thrown and it hit towards the ground. They heard that his body was tied and placed upon the gates of Kufa. And at that point, the menfolk took off their amama and they began to weep and cry. Hussein ibn Ali comes towards Hamida, the young 13 year old daughter of Muslim, and he calls Hamida and says, Oh, Lady Hamida, come sit with me. Come sit with me. Imagine how you must. Feel having to tell a young daughter that she has become an orphan. How do you have that conversation with a 13 year old? How do you say to her that your father's body has not been given its burial rites? How do you say to that young child? He puts Hamida upon his lap and he begins to stroke her blessed face. And she begins to say, Oh, Hussein, my master, Aba Abdullah, tell me what has happened to my father. Why are the menfolk crying in such a way? And he begins to account and say what happened to her father. Hamida begins to weep and begins to cry and slaps her face. Oh, father, what has happened to you, oh, my dear father? At this point, Hussein says, My dear child, now I shall become your father. Oh, dear Dear child, my sons have become your brothers. My daughters have become your sisters. My sisters have become your aunties. We shall now become your guardians and look after you. And at this point we find that eventually the kafila enters in towards the plains of Karbala. Imagine what it must have been like for this family. Because Ahlul Bayt knew what it was going to be when they came towards these plains. And they saw on the previous days the army of Yazid gathering in their hundreds and in their thousands. Hur ibn Yazid al riyahi is speaking directly with Hussein ibn Ali. He is coming face to face and speaking with him. Both of these two armies head towards the plains of Karbala, and then eventually the horse of Hussein stops. Imagine that horse of Hussein, how much of a servant it must have been. Hussein gently kicks the horse as if to say, Go forward, O horse, go forward. But the horse does not go forward. Imam descends from this horse and gets onto another, and another, and another. The hadith say he tries several different horses, but each horse does not move forward. He eventually turns towards them and says, Tell me, what is this place that we have come to? One says, This is. Is tough. 
He says, what does tough mean? He says that this means the bank of a river. He says, what is another name? He says, this is known as Sahil al-Furat. What is the name? What does this mean, Sahil al-Furat? This Sahil al-Furat means that this is the bank of the Euphrates. Tell me, is there another name for this place? He says, we have come to a place known as Karbala. He begins to cry profusely and says, We seek protection from Karbi wal Bala. We seek protection from this sorrow and from these trials of tribulation. Lady Um Kurthum comes towards his it comes towards her brother. She says, Oh Hussein, my dear brother, my heart is aching. My heart is paining because now I feel something in my heart. I feel that there is some heaviness upon me. Please tell me why I feel like like this. Hussein sits the camp down and he addresses his sister and says, Oh sister Kulthum, let me tell you that when we marched with our father Ali towards the battle of Sifin, we stopped at this very same place. My father Ali began to take some rest and he fell asleep upon the lap of his son Hassan, our brother. And after a few minutes he woke up and he said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Hassan asked him, Oh my father, what is it that has happened? What have you seen in this dream? Oh Kurthum, our father called me and said, Oh Hussein, come here. Let me tell you about the dream that I have just seen. I have just seen in my dream that you will be drowning in a pool of blood and you will be asking people for help and no one will come to your aid. Oh Hussein, you will die in this very same place. Oh Kurthum, this will be be the place in which we set up our tents. This will be the place in which our horses will rest. And O oh, Kurthum, this will be the place in which our family members will be martyred. And O oh, Kurthum, from this very place will, be, we, 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 will we be raised on the day of judgment. At this point, Hussein ibn Ali takes a pen and a pad and he writes a letter towards his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. He says, O oh, Muhammad, I swear it is as if this world has never never existed in my eyes and it is as if the hereafter has always been in front of me I am going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-zalameen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zalamu ayyum al-qalabi yanqalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un ma'atim al-Husayn ya Husayn